to a good time, which is a New York thriller directed by Josh and Benny Safdie, who made Daddy Long Legs and Heaven Knows What. We reviewed Heaven Knows What on the program a couple of years ago. And I talked about it being a, uh, a, a film which was a very sort of realistic and gritty experience, but also a film which was quite hard to get into because it essentially involved you spending a lot of time in the in the company of characters who were massively unsympathetic. Now, in the case of this, this stars uh, Robert Pattinson as Constantine Connie Nikas. At the beginning of the film, we see him essentially breaking his brother Nick, played by Benny Safdie, out of a therapy session. Um, and uh, he rescues him, saying, stop asking him these questions, stop asking him th these questions. And uh, he takes his brother, and he takes his brother off as an accomplice on a heist, a rather poorly thought out heist, which rather, you know, expectedly, pretty soon explodes in the brother's face. Next thing, Nick finds himself first in prison and then in hospital. And Connie is scheming to, uh, another way to rescue his brother from another situation. It becomes absolutely clear that he has somehow decided that his mission is to, in inverted commas, to rescue his brother from this terrible situation that he's in and show him another kind of life, show him a good time by getting involved in all these these scams. The film plays out over, I mean, it's basically the course of 24 hours, but a huge amount of it plays over over the course of one restless night in which things go from bad to worse as Connie attempts to rescue his brother, ends up instead accidentally teaming up with an ex-con called Ray and becoming involved in a completely ludicrous and increasingly frightening scheme to retrieve a uh, a pop bottle full of uh, hallucinogens that has apparently been hidden at an Adventureland fairground. The film is interesting for a number of reasons. Firstly, there have been a lot of reviews saying this is the film in which Robert Pattinson demonstrates that he really is you know, a brilliant actor, in which he loses his celebrity status. I mean, a lot of it is shot on streets in which it's evident that, although they have permits, they have permits for some of it, permits for, for more of it than they have for a lot of their other films, but it's evident that Pattinson is being able to move through crowds with aren't necessarily clocking in for what he is. And a lot of critics have said, well, this is the film in which he shows his metal. My own feeling about it is this. I think Robert Pattinson has always been great. I loved Robert Pattinson in, in the Twilight movies. I thought Robert Pattinson was really interesting in uh, Lost City of Zed. I think, you know, we've had him on the programme talking about other projects in which he... The idea that somehow he's suddenly surprising everybody by being a great actor is a bit of is I think a bit of a, a strange situation. And he tells us more about the people who are writing that stuff. Exactly. Right? I mean, for me, the revelation was from the Safties, whose movies in the past I have admired but haven't completely clicked with. In the case of this, I completely clicked with it. It had a really terrific sense of location. I mean, you could you could feel and smell the you know, the streets of Queens and Brooklyn. It's shot in thirty five mil, um, which has been according to the cinematographer, battered and tortured in terms of its exposure. So when you have the nighttime scenes, the exterior scenes, they have this kind of crepuscular half-light that almost feels like in the induced documentary of something like French Connection or Panic and Needle Park, which I think is definitely uh, an inspirational touchstone. Um, the directors have also cited Martin Scorsese's After Hours, as although that's, I think that's a very different feeling of him because that is a film which is, broadly speaking, a kind of a, a, a comic film. In the case of this, there are elements of tragedy comedy in it, but it is, it's, it's a thriller which has sort of absurdist comedy in it. It has a pulsating, really pulsating um, electronic score by Daniel Lubertine, who was told by the directors uh, to have a look at uh, the Tangerine Dream score from Sorcerer, which, as you probably know, is currently on uh, release. And is there it are it certain. It is. I, know, I, should, I should have mentioned it. You can hear echoes of that kind of circling semitonal pulse theme that Tangerine Dream use in that in the score for Good Time. But the score for Good Time is so front and centre. It's like. It's occasionally, you know, it has this kind of analog sounding distortion to it. You can hear the edges of everything cracking. It's like being right in the mind of the central character. The filmmaking itself has this sort of febrile sense of agitation. It's a film which moves at a running pace and goes from one increasingly, you know, ridiculous and, and uh, absurd situation to another, tumbling and running and falling as we follow the schemes of the central character played by Connie. It's also a film which it's kind of bookended by moments of stillness, which emphasise that sort of sense of frenetic feverishness from which the rest of the film is concocted. 
it's it's a this is a word I use a lot, but it is very tactile. You can you can feel the environments, you can feel the textures, you can smell the streets, you 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 kind of feel yourself being pulled along by this character. And what's really fascinating about it is that the central character, played by Robert Pattinson, is massively unsympathetic. He's devious, he's a schemer, he's a chancer, he ha behaves with apparently no care for uh, the fates of anybody else around him, with the exception of his brother. He is completely reckless. He is m hugely incompetent. And one of the reasons that things keep going wrong is through sheer incompetence. And yet the film makes you keep pace with him and doesn't alienate you. And that's a very, very hard trick to do. I mean, the, the, the filmmakers have a very non-judgmental style which sort of presents, I mean, I think it presents, they've talked about the best Pulp Fiction being amoral, although I don't think the film is amoral. I think what, what the film does is map out its characters, map out its situation, and assume that the audience is intelligent enough to make its own decisions about the morality or otherwise of what's playing out. And I thought it was really, really, really well done, really well judged. Uh, there, It is a, a absolutely full-on experience. You come out of it feeling really breathless and really knocked about. And yes, Pattinson is is brilliant in it. That's not the surprise. The surprise is that the film is as good as it is. And particularly when you have a film in which you're referring to films which I love. I mean, any filmmaker who will cite Panic in Needle Park and will cite, you know, Sorcerer and... Should I know Panic in Needle Park? It's an Al Pacino film. Um, Kitty Wynn, uh, Jerry Schatzberg, early 1970s. It was a film that was very controversial. I think it was banned for a while. It's a film about drug addicts and um, and about drug addiction. And I mean, it's a really, it's a, it's a, it's a heartbreaking film. It's a tough watch, but you should see it. Actually, it's really, really good. Okay, I'll um, ignore that.